This is Bo Salisbury coming to you live, obviously live with that live button on from Uniontown, Ohio. And we're going to be jumping into this Tuesday evening series we've been doing uh, for a little bit over a month now on from regional alignment to regional transformation. And we've gotten into some good dialogue thus far with several uh, different guests and just kind of talking about this subject matter, which is actually a huge subject which is why we're going to be doing this ongoing for a little while. And tonight we have a guest, um, a good friend of mine, someone I know you're really going to enjoy hearing. So I want, you, I want to encourage you to share this on your timelines with your friends and your followers. This is going to be a tremendous uh, blessing. I got a feeling we're going to get in some really good dialogue tonight uh, and some conversation. I, I even got a feeling that the Holy Spirit is going to hijack our conversation and give us uh, the heart of God, just from a fresh perspective, and we're all going to be blessed by that. So, so share this with your people, and we're going to jump in here in just a couple minutes. I want to introduce to you um, uh, David Hoskins. He comes from Houston, Texas. Um, he is a very seasoned, uh, actually both apostle and a prophet. Uh, he's been working uh, extensively in the nation of Mexico, but also in different parts of the world, uh, especially in Hispanic-speaking countries and as well as uh, forging uh, some regional development uh, in the Houston area as well. Um, you'll find that he is very sincere, very authentic. Um, just the prophetic grace is very obvious on his life, but also you begin to hear him talk and you, you hear the structure and the organization of an apostle who's built something substantial. And I've been um, partnering with him the last several years in Mexico and I've seen firsthand what he's built from the ground up over the last 20 plus years. I've spent considerable time with a lot of the leaders he has on the ground there in Mexico. And I can attest that he's not a fly by night um, leader with great revelation. He's, he's one that has taken revelation from the Lord. He's built things from the ground up and he's done a great job um, of developing something that's really gaining momentum right now in the nation of Mexico. And so you're going to enjoy hearing him in just a few minutes. We're both going to collaborate on this subject matter. I want to give ample time for him to share his heart with you. Um, he's got some experience to draw from to speak into the subject matter from an apostolic standpoint and also prophetic insight to speak into the subject matter based on what God is speaking to him in this season. I know uh, many of you value present truth revelation. God is speaking. He's speaking all over the world right now uh, to his people. He's speaking to leaders all over the world. And one thing I know he is speaking has to do with regional alignment. I believe it's critically important that we be where God wants us to be in these days, that we be planted um, in the region which God has sent us to, that we take notice of other leaders and other people and other churches and just to have an eye of discernment to recognize what God's doing all around us and to be coordinated with that. And so um, I'm excited about what God is doing and we're going to forge a way into a greater coordination, a greater alignment in the days ahead in the body of Christ. And I believe we're going to see greater effectiveness in the kingdom of God manifesting and changing the world around us as a result of that. But let me just take a couple minutes and, and give it to, to uh, David here. Why don't you take a few minutes and share a little about yourself, um, your ministry, your journey, and then I'll um, kind of open up with a little scripture from the book of Luke, and we'll jump on in this thing. Man, David, welcome. Come on in here and share a little bit from your heart, man. Who are you? Tell the world who you are. Well, thank you so much, Bo. It's a pleasure. To be on here, and just this topic is certainly near and dear to our hearts. Um, our ministry is Kingdom of Answers International, and we kind of came in the ministry through youth ministry, working in a traditional setting, and we did that for many, many years, and somehow in the process inherited a church. Uh, I wasn't ever expecting to move beyond youth ministry, but uh, the Lord had other plans, and but once that, that ministry was handed to us, uh, we knew that the law was going to begin to transition and help us move that thing toward more of a kingdom, five-fold ministry, apostolic model. Uh, so we did that for many years. Uh, and in that process, we saw ministries raised up. We saw a lot of things happening. 
Uh, we were able to travel to quite a few nations during those years and really hone in on who we were. You know, we had things spoken over our lives about being apostolic and prophetic, both my wife and I, and yet um, we always focused that energy toward the local house and then sending out teams and we would go with those teams from the local house. And we planted quite a few works and we planted several works in Mexico. And But during that time, we began to really, I think, see church from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as the Lord transitioned us out of pastoring, uh, we had, I, I think we had a lens on our eyes seeing things through a local church mindset that once we transitioned into more of an apostolic team ministry type of expression, all of a sudden our lens shifted to more of a regional uh, perspective and national perspective. And we begin to see how the living stones in the body of Christ fit together differently when it comes to regional alignment, transformation, uh, so, but we had to, we had to step out of that structure to really see things from a different structural perspective. Took some time, took some time, and yet uh, we've been able to help many ministries shift toward a kingdom mindset, shift into more of a fivefold pattern of ministry. But also, we're working in regions uh, to help regions begin to see the. The potential of what can happen when we connect strength to strength and move from glory to glory um, and break the back of the competition and some of the territorialism. So mm. it's our passion. You know, most of our resume is about helping people transition, shift from one place to the next, shift from one mindset to another. And so we've had to spend a lot of energy because we pioneered. Uh, and in that pioneering, we've started. Uh, movements down in Mexico, and we've had saturations of churches raised up in quite a few regions, and we're finding that one of the greatest challenges is bringing a full discipleship to the saints from a kingdom of God perspective, because a lot of what we do and a lot of what we model is relatively new to Christendom, uh, not so new to the Bible, but new to the way our traditional Christianity is operated. And so because of that, we've had to develop a lot of curriculum, training schools, and all of the processes to help both saints and leaders move toward in a, I would say, a new wineskinned approach to ministry. Hmm. But we're enjoying it. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, pioneers don't always have the luxury of uh, looking at someone else's model or someone else's manual or those type of things you're out there trial and error trying to make things happen and and that's and that's the reality there's there's art there are trials there are errors but there's learning curves that you uh that you discover and things that begin to work and things that begin to gain momentum and i think it's you know seasons like this where people like yourself that have gone through that have really stepped into a fresh understanding of not just grasping concepts from the Bible, but something that's been hammered out on experience. And someone like you has a great, great amount of value for other leaders who are maybe just beginning that process. So your pioneering aspect opens up the door for many others. And so that's one thing I do I appreciate about you is that you're not just doing your own thing. You're helping others to step into that as well. And uh, my understanding is you really beginning to package and really write some of these strategies and um, things down on paper right now. You're said getting some books and you're using those right now currently in Mexico, but there's going to come a day you're going to make those available to the public, correct? Absolutely. You know, mostly where we pioneer is, is in Hispanic type of a setting. And so a lot of our curriculum we've developed with that in mind, but uh, we've developed an entire discipleship curriculum based upon growing in the kingdom, kind of A to C discipleship. It varies from, you know, more of a saint level to a leadership level to really top end leaders laying foundations for regional transformation. We, we're finding we're having to do it all. And so we've had to create those tools, 
have to develop a toolbox because at the end of the day, you know, many people uh, can skip some of the mistakes we've made and shortcut their way to success because we want to gain traction. We want to see some momentum happen in this next season. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I want to share something real quick as we get started here and uh, kind of jumping into this topic matter, which we can go a number of different ways with this. I just want to let you know you're free to flow however the Lord kind of inspires you to do that. And and you and I have a have a way of synergizing and, and kind of playing off each other in a way and stirring one another up. And that's a good thing. Um, but I want to share something I was reading this morning and the Lord was kind of breathing some fresh insight uh, on this passage before. And I think that's what God's doing in me, especially this last year, is that I'm viewing the entire Bible from a regional standpoint and just how important regions are to the heart of God and also how strategic regions are for the enemy to set up strongholds to hinder what's in the heart of God for regions. And I, it's like everywhere I turn, I keep seeing this regional perspective. And I want to share this from with you uh, in Luke chapter 10. Um, Jesus is actually sending out not the 12, but the 70 um, mm. uh, disciples. There's like a second layer of disciples that he began to raise up and send forth. And of course, 70 is an interesting number because Moses had 70 mm. elders. And, and so there's a little correlation between what was taking place in Moses' time and in Jesus' time. So Matthew chapter 16 you know, Jesus brings his 12, not the 70 at that point, brings the 12 to Caesarea Philippi. He asks him that question, who do men say that I am? Of course, Peter answers, you're the son of the living God, Christ, the Messiah. Uh, everyone else thought he was a man or a good teacher, a good prophet or whatever, but Peter got some revelation that he was more than that. And that's when Jesus unveiled to his disciples the nature of the church. And he used the word in Greek, ecclesia which, of course, those of you who are familiar with that term, you understand its origins uh, and the Greek and the Roman um, history there. You understand that ecclesia, and there's several different layers of that, but had to do with elders meeting in city gates and working together on behalf of the, the emperor to represent the government in, in each lo local area. But you can actually all trace this all the way back to Moses in that time period in terms of the concept of ecclesia. But anyway... So Jesus takes these 70 elders, these 70 others, you no know, disciples, really. Uh, he sent them two by two before his face into every city mm -hmm. and every place. And, and this kind of jumped off the page at me. And it says every city and every place where he himself uh, was about to go. You know, I believe on the heart of God, God loves every region. God loves every city. And he raises up leaders to represent him in that city and in that territory. Mm -hmm. And part of what God is doing today is taking those pioneering leaders, especially to connect them in different regions to begin to represent the fullness of his heart. Because all of us, uh, we see in part, you know, all of us have a piece of the puzzle. All of us are gifted uh, uniquely by God in different ways. And mm -hmm. God's beginning to assemble the, the elders in the gates, so to speak, in terms of his ecclesia. And part of that process uh, involves a deconstruction. It involves a deconstruction of preconceived notions. It involves a de deconstruction of, of the whole competition clause. It, it involves a number of things that God's working on in our hearts that he's preparing us to connect on a deeper level once we allow the Holy Spirit to work on us. So Jesus sends out these 70 leaders into every city and every place where he was about to go because he's wanting them to begin to connect in relationship and get assess what's going on there and make preparation for what god wants to do i believe all of us are really in a similar mode of john the baptist in our regions where god is wanting us to connect with one another prepare the way so he can do in each region what he wants to do but the reality is if God had his way, he would move in every region in a powerful way. But that only happens if the leaders in each region connect and cooperate with his desire. So you walk this story and he goes on and tells them some instructions and so forth. And, and you know, the 70 actually return in verse number 17. 
Uh, the 70 return with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us mm -hmm. in your name. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Mm -hmm. Behold, I give you uh, authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, uh, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written um, in heaven. So here's the concept I want to share, just kind of laying a foundation. We can kind of roll with this. You know, Jesus begins to, he sends out these 70 elder, elders, well, not elders, but leaders, disciples who are becoming elders, um, gives them a mission to really assess what's going on in the land, connect with the son of peace in the house, build relationship and begin to prepare the way for what Jesus wants to do in each of these regions. And they, they come down and they're amazed that the demons are subject to them. And remember, he sent them out two by two. It's the principle of oneness and team ministry that comes into collaboration here. And when they begin to engage in a, that level of team ministry and, and their assignment of the Lord, they discovered an added authority they did not have before. And so they were surprised. They were like amazed that the demons were subject to them. Um, and he said something very powerful. And I'm going to kind of kind of leave this right here and throw it to you, David, for a few minutes here. Um, but he said something powerful. He says, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And there's different dimensions of demonic forces here. And you can kind of correlate that with Ephesians 6, you know, the different levels of you know, wicked spirits and high places and principalities and powers. But Jesus makes a bold statement here. He says, I am empowering you with all authority over all the power of the enemy. That is a very strong statement. And what I began to see, what I was taking notice of today, just kind of looking at this passage, is that in every region of the earth, the enemy sets up strongholds to hinder what God wants to take place. But God is sending and connecting leaders together to function in as one in a level of team ministry that requires love and honesty and honor and deferring one another and walking together. That if we wouldn't come into a greater degree of alignment in regions of the earth, I believe we also will step into a greater authority mm -hmm. to deal with the demonic world. And here's, here's what I think also, the converse is, is also true. If we do not come into alignment, we actually forfeit uh, the land in a sense. And we, we basically do not allow what God, God's heart and vision for that region to take fruition. So it a lot depends and hinges upon regional alignment in terms of seeing a region transform because you can't go in and spoil the goods until you first find the strong man. So that's my mm -hmm. opening statement. I want to throw it to you, David, and kind of whatever's kind of stirring in your heart uh, in terms of regional alignment to regional transformation and kind of see where we roll with this thing here. Well, I think you hit on a, a pretty big issue, and that is the idea of team ministry. You know, I think we've seen a lot of Lone Rangers. We've seen a lot of, you know, people raised up as the premier leader that we all look to and I think there was a season for that, almost like with Israel, there was the time of the judges where God would raise one up and mm -hmm. everyone would rally around. But uh, I believe we know that the future is about team ministry. And uh, we yeah. see that example with Christ. Obviously, we see that example in the Godhead. We also see that example over and over in the New Testament as the body of Christ and the, the kingdom was being expanded. It was always in this idea of team in this idea of apostolic teams, and this idea of leaders converging in assignments, focusing on territories. And, um, you know, even the idea of raising up a local assembly was never really an objective per se. It was the byproduct of the advancement of the kingdom because there was a, there was a continual developmental reality that needed to take place mm -hmm. in the lives of those saints. Um, but, you know, when you begin to talk about pulling regions together or, or seeing alignment take place in the body of Christ or certainly engaging the task of transformation, it takes 
the gospel of conversion to the gospel of the kingdom. <laughs> All mm -hmm. of a sudden, we're not just discipling saints. We have to disciple nations. You know, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 says, in the, in the last days, the house of the mountain of the Lord will be raised up. And that all the nations will come to the, that mountain, the kingdom of God, that we, the house of God, are occupying. Mm -hmm. And why are they coming to us? They're coming to us to learn the ways of our God, because we're modeling. We're, we're showing something that, that I believe the earth will look at and say, hey, how do you do that? Where did you, where did you gain that understanding? What DNA did you tap into? And you know, it's all about Jesus, the fivefold nature of Christ. But I believe we focused it more upon local assemblies in the last season. We haven't really seen the potential of what it looks like to, to really see the body of Christ from a regional perspective with mm -hmm. local assemblies being a key part of that bigger puzzle. Uh, they're essential. They're absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. But having pastored for many years and having tried to do kingdom things and having tried to do, I would say, transformational things and citywide things, we were all about the kingdom. But the platform was weak in its ability to bring a city together because mm -hmm. of the, the nature of the territorialism within the platform itself, the way the structures of local assemblies are developed they really are more in competition with one another by nature, by the way it was built, mm -hmm. than they are in any type of co-laboring capacity, or there's certainly not much synergy bubbling up between them. Uh, mm -hmm. You can pretty much come together for coffee and donuts, maybe worship, but beyond that, the moment somebody says, let's talk about transformation, uh, all of a sudden, who's in charge? becomes the issue and so there's many things that have to be pioneered in this day and we've had to do some of that you know in mexico we we've had to pioneer and, and even when we were here in the city and we were pastoring and trying to pioneer kingdom things here in the city i think the challenge for us that we learned early on is that everybody's not in the same place and everybody's not in the same season. And so we, when we try to do these ecumenical things where we bring all of the different streams and all the different tribes together, what tends to happen is we have to water down what we're doing so much so mm -hmm. that we don't offend or we don't cause somebody to stumble or, you know, to be honest, charismatic Christianity can be pretty crazy. It can be pretty wild in comparison to a lot of traditional Christian circles. I mean, it's almost like tongues. You walk in and somebody's speaking in tongues. It doesn't edify unless there's interpretation. Well, you almost need interpretation if you walk into a charismatic service from a traditional background. And right. so mm -hmm. there's a process. And so I've learned that, you know, I like what Dutch Sheet says, and it's, it's, a, it's really a good way to look at this is that, you can go to lunch with just about anybody, but you can't go to war with everybody. Mm -hmm. And so there are some alignments that are more tribal. And there are some alignments that I think can be more on a national or on a corporate citywide level. But it all depends on the assignment that we're attempting to engage. Mm -hmm. I know for us specifically, we've tried to bring cities together. We've tried to bring regions together in Mexico and other places. And we've seen some traction depending on the banner we're raising. If it's worship, if it's, if it's, you know, harp and bowl and crown type prayer and intercession and those type of things mingled together with worship. Uh, we've gained some traction with that. We've seen a lot of different streams and groups come together, but when it comes to other things, uh, it, it, it becomes challenging. And so I think you can actually waste a lot of energy trying to get everybody into the same place or into the same building and actually accomplish very little. Uh, so we've tried to do it both directions, um, but, but the mainstay of our energy, we spend with those who are really, I would say, drinking in the DNA that we're, that we're serving up. 
Mm. And uh, there are a lot of people that are hungry for the kingdom and the move of the Holy Spirit and understanding how the fivefold works together, uh, both in assemblies and also in regions. And so for that reason, we really try to take those who are of the same mindset, you know, I mean, if, if you were looking at the, the nation of Israel, there were certain tribes that were more closely aligned than other tribes. And yet God made it so that they had to come together at the appointed times. Mm -hmm. So they would have to press into their national identity and they couldn't just stay tribal. So mm -hmm. we, it's kind of a both end, but if I'm going to spend my energy, most of it's going to be spent working with those who are, I think, on the edge of the pioneering aspect of ministry, because that's a big part of who we are. I think you and I have had this conversation before ourselves about um, emphasizing what God has given you the responsibility to build and building with those who have similar DNA as you, mm -hmm. but at the same time, staying open for a portion of your energy in your ministry to plant seed mm -hmm. in those who might be not quite the same DNA to help basically be what uh, Priscilla and Aquila were to Apollos. Mm -hmm. so in other words, 90% of our energy really should be devoted towards uh, aligning with people that have a very similar DNA, but we, we all should have a maybe a 10%, this is my theory anyway, a, at, least a, at least a portion of our heart and our relationships and our ministry reaching out to those who aren't a part of our exact circle to plant seed. You might not be able to build with them, but you can plant seed and help lift them up to the next level of revelation. Uh, case in point, I, I don't do this often, you know, going to churches that are not uh, Pentecostal, but I ministered in a Baptist church. Now, there was a few people that spoke in tongues there. But the vast majority did not. I did that last weekend. This, and because I'm building a relationship with the leaders, I felt I wanted to encourage them, be a blessing. And so we ministered in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I, I was Aquila and Priscilla, and we helped the, the Apollosis come up to the next level. So, But I think as a whole, though, I, I love what you said, that our alignment has to be assignment-based, mm -hmm. and that, that alignment is going to look a little bit different based on the relationship and how we connect you know, one with another. I mean, you've got, like I said, the Apollos, Aquila, Priscilla, that's one type of alignment. Um, you've got Paul and Barnabas type of alignments that are very closely inter interrelated. I mean, um, if I could be just a little bit personal, I feel like that's a, a similar type of relationship God's developing with, with you and I, mm -hmm. uh, co-laboring in ways that are very closely knit because our hearts, our vision, our DNA is very, very much akin one to another. And so I've been, I've been serving and helping you as a Barnabas per se. Uh, and what you're doing in Mexico, um, just being encouragement and being a blessing to help what you're doing there. And and you've also been a blessing to to support what I'm doing in other parts of the, the nation here and so forth. But it's it's a new concept of um, shared apostleship, something that you you coined mm -hmm. and yeah. kind of talked to me about as well. Shared apostleship, where it's not just the one man show, which I think the first phase of apostleship in the last 30 years has really been uh, dominated by one apostle leading a ministry with everybody else supporting that one apostle. But I think the next phase we're entering into is a stronger dimension of team ministry of really uh, working together and converging on different assignments. And so I think that's an important thing we're, we're kind of stepping um, into. You know, what, what you just shared a little bit ago stirred me in a number of different ways, but I don't want to hog the conversation here. Uh, but the reality I'm is we good. have to recognize you know, where God is calling each one of us to uh, invest our energy, that we don't get bogged down by the big picture and trying to be one with everybody, but recognize the key relationships and what that looks like in terms of alignment based on assignment. I, mm -hmm. I made mention of, you know, Apostle Paul and Barnabas, they, they came to uh, Jerusalem and uh, they met up with Peter, James and John, and they were kind of discerning each other's grace they, they were trying to figure out what what is the assignment and relationship look like between us based on our giftings and what God's called us to do. And so they they recognized that, and because they discerned it, they properly aligned and they worked together based on that. And I think that's something we really got to continue to walk down. 
yeah. uh, that road and develop uh, those type of things? We have to model it. I mean, the truth is convergence takes more work. It takes a lot more work. You know, when you operate from a vertical perspective, fathers to sons, it's easy because I mean, yeah, yeah, you got problem children. You have to deal with that. But when you're, when you're converging with peers and you're having to discern the grace of one another, that, that needs to happen without ambition getting in the way, without ego getting in the way. You have to be able to discern grace to grace and know you know, when it's Paul and Barnabas and when it's Barnabas and Paul, because Luke referred to them both ways. And yeah. it was always in the context of assignment. It was always in the context of the platform that was being raised up. And I, and I think in the days ahead, platform is probably a really key phrase. I, I think we could spend conferences just focusing on what the new platforms are supposed to look like that are emerging, because when you look at platforms, I think in the past, we think of a platform as an organization. We mm. think of it as some structural, some networking thing. But in reality, the platforms that are emerging in the days ahead are assignments. They're tied to the land. They're tied to iniquitous structures that are trying to hold on to their place in the land. And so as we engage these assignments, we're going to need to converge as leaders because there's, an, a, there's a corporate strength that comes as grace comes to grace, and we begin to gain the mind of Christ for uprooting what is standing in the way of breakthrough. And I, I think a lot of regional transformation is tied to those principles alone. But to be honest, the first step is we have to get out of ourselves, out of our own way mm -hmm. to to really press into one another, to not just love, to not just appreciate, but truly discern the grace in one another, because there's, there's, there's a time for everyone to shine. And, and, and we have to learn to esteem one another greater than ourselves. We have to learn to push one another forward. We have to learn, and, and not, not in the context of well, let's just give everybody a chance or let's just give everybody a shot. Or, you know, I, I think of talent shows in the past and that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about truly allowing those who are supposed to carry the baton for this moment in this assignment or this event to do so. Mm -hmm. And then we just align up with that and, and, and we begin to bring the, the strength of what needs to come behind it. That's so good. You know, as I was ministering this last weekend on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and just how powerful that is uh, in our lives, I was thinking about the, the disciples of Jesus that were sent out two by two and, and they developed teams. And I look at the pre-Pentecost disciples who were constantly bickering over who's the greatest disciple and jealous of one another. I mean, I can't just imagine, you know, Peter, James and John. They get special access to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration. The other nine are down below, jealous and griping and complaining. And, you know, so you have that dynamic taking place. But it's amazing to me that after the baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place on the Pentecost, you begin to see a synergy take place. And you begin to see that they them get, gain traction. Um, another thing I was thinking of, you know, Acts chapter 2, when this took, takes place and and Peter begins to preach that message. It says that Peter stood up with the 11 and mm -hmm. said, that is key right there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that Peter just preached the message because he was the man. He stood up with the 11. That, that's significant. Uh, dealing with the, the, the fire of the Holy Spirit that began to burn out of their hearts. This yeah. competition that seemed to drive them before. And now they begin to walk together on a greater degree of uh, unity which I think gave them access to greater degree of authority. Now, I also see this with Paul, and this is what the Lord was speaking to me just a moment ago. I've never really seen this before, so this is kind of fresh off the press here. Um, but when you look at Paul and Barnabas and the engagement of their relationship, when they were sent out from Antioch to begin to expand kingdom influence, you know, there was a definite shift. Barnabas was primarily the one who discipled Paul and brought him back to uh, Antioch and also gave him access to the apostles in Jerusalem initially too. 
Mm -hmm. uh, after they were sent out, you begin to see Paul begin to take more of a, a leadership role and being the primary speaker. And so that shifted back and forth from time to time. But eventually, you know, the dynamics of the relationship got a little bit uh, uh, touchy and they end up splitting up because of, of a division there. Now, what I began to notice here is that the next phase of Paul's ministry, you know, Barnabas goes out of the picture, Silas comes into the picture, he, he re-engaged with team ministry. Now, some people, some leaders, after going through difficulties like that, they'll mm -hmm. develop the thing, well, see, this team ministry thing doesn't work, I'm just going to do it in my own way. And I feel like yeah. I think, feel like a number of leaders today have engaged uh, in team ministry and they have given up because of the sour mm -hmm. experiences they've had. But God is trying to say to re-engage, but to walk with a greater degree of maturity and love in the season and to engage with those that God says to engage with. But what I noticed was this, after that second level of Paul's ministry of re-engaging with team ministry, expanding the kingdom, you begin to see him really and their team, their entire team gain some traction. I mean, they did some good things for the churches of Galatia and the other places they were reached on that first phase. But that second phase, when they began to hit Corinth and, and Ephesus, there was a whole nother level of authority. And I believe that it was, it really stems to the level of unity of the relationships and, and the, the blessing that those relationships bring. All, going all the way back to my initial point uh, from Luke chapter 10, is that they begin to step into a dynamic of authority to deal with demonic spirits when they stepped into a new engagement of team ministry. That's where I believe we're heading to. Yeah. I mean, probably three, four years ago, I'll, I'll stop with this thought here because you, you just stir me up, man, and I can go on forever. I don't want to hog the time here. But, you know, several years ago, I began to ask the question because here we are in the United States of America and, and we've got great revelation. Uh, we've got great uh, apostles and prophets. We've got this understanding of seven mountain influence and cultural transformation and we've got access to all of this revelation all these books all these seminars all these bible schools we got we got so much at our disposal and yet we see so very little of actual regional transformation and so the question i begin to ask god is you know how can that be what why is that i truly believe that the reformation we desire to see, the transformation we desire to see in our region around us is really contingent upon the degree of reformation and transformation we allow God to do within us. Mm -hmm. so that's where I feel like we're at right now is those who are, and it's a continual process, those that are allowing God to purify us, that same baptism of fire that began to burn yeah. in the disciples from pre-Pentecost to post-Pentecost, that same fire, I believe, is burning today in this season for those who will allow God. I mean, Romans 12 says that we need to present ourselves as living sacrifices. And what happens to that sacrifice on the altar? The fire of God begins to consume. So there is a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit that's available for all of us in this season. Not just a baptism that's going to give us passion and give us a great anointing to display to the masses, but a baptism of fire that's going to purify our hearts. They're mm -hmm. going to qualify us for healthy relationships. They're going to bring us into greater maturity, ultimately greater authority to deal with the strongholds in our region. And so that's what I'm beginning to see more uh, and more. No, I, you know, honestly, Bo, if I look at the assignments that I engage now and have grace to engage now, I would have wanted to engage those long before I was graced to engage them. It's not that I was lacking in revelation, but I, I had not gone through the crucible. I had not come through the fire. I didn't have enough of my flesh roasted. To mm -hmm. be honest, I was so in the way of myself, ambitious, you know, I, I was needing validation. All of those things that most young ministers have to go through when they're trying to step into identity and and, and if I would have engaged things at that time, I think I would have had the passion and the zeal. I, I think I might have even laid hold of the revelation. But there's something to be said about being being buffeted and, and, and the seasoning that comes with maturing in the Lord, going through some things, facing the failure, facing the challenges, facing the things that didn't work. 
you know, pioneering is one of those things that you, you learn a lot about what's right by doing what's wrong. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, the truth is, I think we've set up a lot of young leaders for failure by by having this one leader mindset versus instead of team ministry. Um, you know, when I look at Paul and and Timothy and Silas, they were an apostolic team. You can go and look and you read the book of Thessalonians. All of those letters to the Thessalonians were written by those three people, not Paul. Mm-hmm. It was written by the team, an apostolic team. And that wasn't just a team. That was a transgenerational team. That was, I mean, Silas was more notable a, a, a prophet than an apostle, even though with the Thessalonians, he was referred to in an apostolic way. Well, hold that thought right there. But that, that yeah. proves the point. Because yeah. every seminary in America today, we're taught, and I've been to Bible college, we're taught that Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Right. Paul did, doesn't take credit himself. That, that shows you the mindset we've got to have shifted in our generation yes. to understand and really access what God wants to give us. Go ahead. No, but you tie the generations together. You tie those foundational graces together, working in symphony. And when you got a senior leader like Paul leading that team, then all of those that are coming up in the ranks don't have to make the same mistakes. They don't have to go through the same fire in the same way. They don't have to face the depth of failure or the depth of loss or the depth of grief that maybe Paul had to face. And and I think in the days ahead, it's going to be really critical that we see the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob modeled in apostolic team ministry. We need that Abrahamic, you know, I mean, the old man dreams a dream, the young men have vision, the, the, the children prophesy. There's a there's a relationship when we tie those generations together, but there's also an incredible protection in that. I mm-hmm. wish I wish I had had mature apostles that said, "Hey, you know, don't just read my book, don't just you know come to my seminar, but walk with me in ministry together. Watch my character, watch my 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 humanity, watch." the divinity moving through me by way of the grace and the Holy Spirit. Watch how I dance with the, with the Holy Spirit and, and how it's more the Holy Spirit than it is me. Watch that and watch how I take myself out of the way. If, if we would see seasoned leaders take sons and daughters, not, not into their ministry, but to sit at the same table with them, you know, not the adult table and, that's the children's table, but the same table of strategy, the same table of, of regional engagement and transformation. And I just think we could gain a lot of traction if we get the next generation thinking about something other than doing it better than we did it. Yeah. Come on. We got to, we've got to find a better path. That's so good. I, I hear exactly what you're saying. You know, just the necessary um, connections, alignments, both generationally, um, you might say vertically, those that are more mature than us, but also horizontally um, yes. at the same time are, are so necessary because in the apostolic team that Paul exemplified in his ministry, I mean, there was there were leaders, all different levels of maturity, all that functioned in different ways, you know. You know, you've got the apostle Paul as that Abrahamic, you know, strong leader and the Timothy as the young up and coming guy, but uh, oftentimes there was a guy in between, whether there was a Barnabas or a Silas that that uh, Timothy could still glean from, you know, mm-hmm. in that team that wasn't necessarily spiritual father material, but maybe a big brother and uncle material and just right. you know, allowing the dynamics of spiritual family um, to take place. And this is what I see God wanting to develop in each region. Uh, not not so much a pecking order of who's got the greatest anointing or authority in this region or you know or that kind of thing but but still a humility to recognize whose voice needs to be amplified so all can hear from that and draw from that right so, so who are the fathers in each region who are uh, those that are, are gifted in certain ways in each region how do they fit together as a family you know if, if we can break free from 
you know, individualism and just this mindset of what's in it for me and how can we come together and how can we uh, encourage one another? I mean, you know, one of the one of the problems we have in this generation amongst leaders here, kind of watching watching our clock here, because we could probably go all, all night here, sure. is that there are so many leaders that are, are lonely, are disconnected. Um, I would say this is based on, you know, 20 some years of traveling ministry and hundreds and hundreds of churches and I've known hundreds of leaders, but probably eight out of 10 leaders that I've ministered for over the years. Um, many of them are in denominational churches, whether it's you know, mainline uh, Pentecostal churches or independent churches. Well, eight out of 10 had uh, people that they could look to as authority figures, but there really wasn't true dynamic relationship there. You know, mm -hmm. everyone in a denominational circle, they have someone that's over their particular region, but no personal relationship there. So there's a disconnect vertically, but also a disconnect horizontally as well. How many leaders feel all alone and they, they have challenges and they can't speak some things within their local church because certain people won't understand and things mm -hmm. will be taken out of context. And so, you know, one of the things I think God is doing regionally is, is helping to bridge the gap both in both of those dimensions, both mm -hmm. horizontally and vertically, those that we can really draw from within a region um, and those uh, they really connect side by side in a region uh, to uh, kind of lock arms and hearts more specifically and, and first and foremost uh, to, to gain access to what God wants to do in each region. You know, if we can have a stronger level of connection horizontally and vertically within the region, we'll see a lot less ministry failures, um, a lot less uh, uh, spiritual attacks that take leaders out, uh, a lot less, you know, different issues, whether it's financial infidelity or sexual impropriety, uh, whatever the issue is, even just being discouraged and being depressed or suicides. I mean, how many pastors have we heard mm -hmm. in the last generation committing suicide who, for all intents and purposes, look like they're a success with large churches and followings and ministry? Well, there's a lot of lonely pastors out there. And so what I think God wants to do is, is put it in the heart of some pioneering uh, leaders who will meet in this in the city gates or even yeah. your toil gates because it's not just about each city it's about each region as well uh, to to really bridge the gap to put a stop to what the enemy's trying to do and the hearts and lives of leaders we we can really do this thing better I think God's going to help us to to do this better. No, I think converging in in regions is key. I think you're right. You know, and it, it's the responsibility of apostles and prophets to create the joints and the ligaments. You know, we have to create those connecting mechanisms. And, you know, I, I think if we can create the right platforms that don't take inordinate ownership of things, uh, but just basically create a, um, a conduit or, or, or a platform for different assignments to be raised up. I think part of the challenge is we have a tendency to galvanize what we do and, and, and we we'll want to do, see it happen the same way over and over and over again with the same leader over and over. Well, God raised up this leader. So now he's our, he's our King. Right. God raised up this leader. This is our judge. We'll look to him. He'll save us. No, we've, we've, we've got to learn to be Kings and priests unto our God. We're, we, all have to rise up, but yet we have to learn how to identify when there's a corporate anointing on someone and rally behind it, you know, for this assignment and, and rally behind this one for this another assignment mm -hmm. and learn to draw from the different strengths that are in our region. And rather than reinvent the wheel everywhere, let's get behind the wheel that's really moving and see some momentum happen. I think we can do that. I think we're sharp enough to do that. I think we've got the revelation to do that. I even think we have enough seasoned ministers to do that. Mm -hmm. But honestly, so many of the, I would say, seasoned ministers have had to take so many hits, yeah. even attempting to pioneer that they're a little bit gun shy. They're a little bit timid and sticking their head out of the shell uh, because you get in these environments where I would say there's a revelation and there's, there's, there's things that you can apprehend that God wants to do. Mm -hmm. And the ones that really should be talking about it, the ones that really should be, you know, laying the strategies out, they're silent. 
Mm. And the ones who are jumping in and saying, let's do this thing, they're the ones who really don't even have their grace buffeted to the extent that they're ready to engage it. That's so true. But, but, but what do you do? You know, I mean, when you're in that scenario, there is no structure that exists because everything exists is, you know, these islands all over the place, but there's no synergy between them. So my experience has been, we have to model something on an embryonic level yeah. so that others will see it, yep. apprehend it and allow it to get impregnated within them so it can begin to come forth. So we try to model things on a very small level that we can then shine the, you know, shine the, shine the light on and say, Hey, look, it worked here in this atmosphere. It worked in a village. Hey, it worked on an Island. You know, it worked in a small town, but when you begin to bite off a city like Houston, Texas, <laughs> and you try to pull the players together, uh, it's an it's an interesting monster to even begin to to look at, yeah. and yet we're seeing great things happen. We're seeing great movements. We're seeing traction take place in the prayer movement. Traction take place in worship. Um, on a transformational level, I don't think we've moved beyond prayer and worship. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say we also have a strong movement of I would say compassion ministry and social gospel. Uh, crisis evangelism, and yet when it comes to creating the the joints and ligaments and begin to talk about what could, this thing could look like, nobody's ready to to bite that one off. And 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 I don't blame them because I don't even know if we can at this point in a city like this. So, but yet some of the villages we engage. It's not that difficult. We have a saturation of churches. They're all working together. There's a sense of harmony and synergy. There's that commanded blessing, like mm -hmm. the precious oil flowing down across the high priest and mm -hmm. across the beard and to the body. There's, there's that dynamic that's happening so we can see it modeled on an embryonic level, yet we have to, we have to take on some cities too. We have to really, really engage it. And, and I'm not sure. Uh, all the the how to's. I've got my ideas. I've got my strategies. But uh, when I'm in my city, where I'm at right now, I'm more quiet than I am noisy. And uh, and and I'm on that. I'm that way on purpose. And yet I go into other regions and I have liberty to engage it on a different level. Part of that's the fact that I'm in this city. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of the Jesus factor where he couldn't do many miracles in his own hometown because yeah. he's the carpenter's son. Yeah. You get into another field and all of a sudden your grace is able to operate without that hindrance. Yeah, and that's so true, man. I, man, I greatly appreciate uh, what you're sharing here. You're, just, you're laying down a lot of wisdom uh, and revelation. The truth is, you know, you and other leaders have, have learned some things regarding uh, the subject matter but we as the body of christ we're still learning you know, we're still trying to figure this out you know I, I don't think that paul and his team had it all figured out when they went on their first missionary trip i think they were in a huge learning curve you know but the more they learn and apply the, the more success they had so um, mm -hmm. i like the principle you were sharing about um, exemplifying this on an embryonic level to begin to build off of that and to inspire others i mean uh, what, what do you think, um, you know, Paul and his team, what were they doing when they went from region to region? As a team, they were re really a mini church or a spiritual family that could exemplify teamwork and love one for another mm -hmm. to the very churches that they're planting. They had, they had a, mo a model to look to right there. And so I think that's one of the successes of, of being able to develop kingdom embassies in different regions and these churches that grew and developed and a number of those end up being regional centers that impacted their entire region around them. I think yeah. the success rate that they had was linked to the fact that they, they modeled on a small level, Paul and Barnabas on a relational level, they modeled on a team level, but the, the entire apostolic team, which involved a number of different leaders, 
working together at different times in different places. But so then the, the new churches, they had something to look at as a model of love and honor and unity. And it made all the difference in the world. Um, you, you said a moment ago that when we're, we're so, um, we're, we have a great tendency to try to galvanize things. Once we figure out something that works, we want to franchise it. We want to do the same thing all over the world. Not understanding that every region is different. Every strongholds are different in different regions. The gifts uh, and leaders are different in different regions. There's a lot of unique characteristics that only the Spirit of God can orchestrate. I mean, when I look at the transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, the biggest difference I see is in the Old Covenant, the Spirit of God came on select people at select times. And today, the Spirit of God comes to abide within every one of us. And God is wanting to teach us to be led by the Spirit, not by the letter of the law. I mean, when uh, when Jesus, I'm going to share a couple of thoughts, I'm going to be done, and then I'm going to give you the last little minute here because we're closing our time. Jesus didn't set up a new denomination when he left the planet. He didn't say, okay, Peter, you're the senior pastor. James, you're the youth pastor. Uh, Bartholomew, you can lead the worship. You know, They didn't set this strong pecking order. With He didn't create a, a new 10 new covenant laws You know, to replace the old 10. You know? you know, the, the, what he did was impart his spirit. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were expected to allow the Holy Spirit to lead them, uh, not only in their personal growth, but to lead them in their relationships, lead them in their ministries, and see this divine convergence continue to unfold so that ultimately the gospel goes from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost um, parts of the earth. So I, I think we've got a long way to go. We've, we're, we're stepping into something, I think, in this season. Um, we, we're going we're gonna to see some progress, no doubt about it. Um, but we can't, we can't get stuck in this uh, setting traditions up and setting hierarchy and, and, and going that whole route because we're just going to kill it. We're just going to kill it if we do that. No doubt about it. But take, hey, th thank you so much for sharing tonight. Uh, we'll have we'll have you back again sometime. We'll do a part two. Um, but maybe a couple final thoughts you have here, and then we'll wrap up uh, this evening. Thanks, Bo, and thanks again for just having me. You know, my final thoughts would be the challenges that lay ahead of us are that we don't take what revelation we're gaining and just try to take the old wine skin and use new terminology with it, mm, but good. that we actually allow the Lord to bring us into the new fully. Uh, you know, I see a lot of churches that are laying hold of this idea of the apostolic, laying hold of fivefold ministry, hearing buzzwords like hub and apostolic center and, you know, apostolic embassy and, and everybody has a different definition for all these things, but I see a lot of churches that are wanting to move in the new, but rather than move in the new, they're just moving in new terminology, doing the same things that they've always done. And so I, I wanna caution us away from that direction and say that we need new platforms. Mm -hmm. We don't have to destroy the old platforms entirely i think i think every aspect of christendom is a is a component in itself but i believe at the core if i was to centralize the the activity or centralize the strategy or centralize the revelation that would be flowing out it would be in an apostolic team type platform mm -hmm. that many different things are looking to to gain some corporate momentum and it might be many of those apostolic type of entities that also learn how to converge together and engage a city but i think it's really important that we don't try to take a local church and turn it into the new wineskin right because the fact of the matter is God is raising up living stones that are being fitly joined together into a spiritual house. Yeah. And that has to be engaged on a regional level if we're going to see regional transformation take place. So the connecting points and the platforms that need to emerge must see the region, not through the lens of a local assembly, but see the region through the lens of the kingdom of God 
and the kingdom of darkness, and then lay hold of all types of ministries, including local assemblies, to see the strategy emerge hand in hand in the trenches, going after the things that stand in the way of the glory of God springing into fullness. Mm, that's so good. We can't just repackage the old. We, we're going to have to disassemble some things. And that doesn't make this season easy, yeah. but it, it is worth doing. I was talking to a pastor not long ago, and he's totally bought in. I believe it. I see the fivefold. I understand it. I have the revelation. I really believe God's doing this. I'm just not ready for my church to do that. Mm. <laughs> there's, some, there's some death that has to take place within the hearts yeah. of leaders in order to make that transition. Yeah. It's difficult. I mean, but then you look at the you look at the churches in the book of Revelation and the lampstand. You know, Jesus would reveal this is this is what you need to deal with. Yep. And he said, if you don't deal with this, I'm going to remove the lampstand. Hmm. I think the lampstand is shining brightly. And if we don't allow ourselves to get on the rock that it will not shake. <laughs> <laughs> If we don't allow ourselves to be seated upon the rock that has become a mountain that is going to fill the whole earth, and we continue to try to build our houses on sand, mm -hmm. we're going to miss this thing altogether. And it takes courage. It takes a different mindset to step into the new. And, and, and to be honest, Bo, I've seen a lot of people attempting to move toward the new and, and not executing it well. It yeah. takes it takes more than pastoral grace to execute it. Yeah. It takes apostolic and prophetic grace. I, I work with a lot of churches, a lot of ministries that are wanting to transition. And many leaders have a mindset, I need to get some apostolic and prophetic information so hmm. that I can shift this thing. Uh, what they need is apostolic grace and prophetic grace. It's yeah. team. We need one another. Yeah. And so we need pastors doing pastoral things, <laughs> prophets doing prophetic things, apostles doing apostolic things. And when, when we discern our graces accurately, mm. I'm convinced the dream teams will arise in regions. That's it. That's it. Amen. That's awesome. Amen. You mentioned a minute ago, and we're going to close here with this here, um, about the churches of Revelation. When it came to Ephesus, which was the primary church, out of which all those other churches were birthed. Yeah. He, he gave uh, Apostle John, of course, relaying from the heart of the Lord. He gave a pretty stern message that if they didn't get their stuff together, God was going to remove the lampstand out of its place. Yeah. That word place is speaking of the regional influence That's that right. it had for that whole region. That's sobering. But, but think about the responsibility that we have in, in, in regions. This is not just about um, aligning ourselves so we can get something from other people. This is about all of us aligning ourselves to the heart of God so God's will can be done. And if we don't do our part, not only do we miss out on what we would receive personally, we're, we're, we're short-circuiting something for the entire region. Yeah. And so so there's, there's definitely a responsibility we have to come into this thing in this season. And uh, those regions that cooperate versus those that don't we're going to see a big difference in the level of transformation in those regions from one region to another um we, we already are stuff where, we already are seeing it i mean yeah. i see regions that are coming into a new level of operation it, now granted it's happening more in third world and developing world but it's happening yeah. it's happening where people are willing to engage it selflessly that's it. So good. Wow. Um, I'm not sure how to end this thing, but we just got to keep on flowing. No, we could do this for hours for sure. I know we could, we could. But uh, yeah, I want to just put in a real quick plug here. Um, how can people get a hold of you? Of course, you they can follow you on Facebook. Uh, some different uh, leaders can connect with you on Facebook. And do you have a website or any other way people can contact you? We do. Facebook, uh, Kingdom Advancers International is our Facebook page. It's the most active way that we communicate, uh, but on our webpage, we're building that out. We're actually in the process of 
revamping that. We're going to be adding a lot of our materials to it. We're going to be adding our Growing in the Kingdom curriculum. So we're going to start to really become more visible now that we have some tools to, to really help the body of Christ with. I know that we're, we're really unpackaging those trainings this year, next year. Uh, there's going to be about 20 different trainings that we're going to be really making available to the body of Christ and their progressive walk into the things of the kingdom, discovering who you are in the kingdom, your role in the kingdom, understanding all the dimensions of the kingdom. Uh, so it, it should be a lot, of, a lot of help for many saints who are hungry. Um, but uh, our website is kingdomadvancers.com. Okay, kingdomadvancers.com. So kingdomadvancers.com. I would, I would encourage anybody watching, you know, perhaps God may put it on your heart to support uh, through missions what uh, David has pioneered in Mexico. I mean, understand, especially in a time like this, there's, there's great need there mm -hmm. on a financial basis. Uh, most other countries don't have stimulus checks like we do in times like this, you know. <laughs> So maybe God might put it on your heart to be a blessing to his ministry that way. I believe there's a link you can donate on kingdomadvancers.com, correct? That's the website. There you is. Share this with your uh, people. If this will be a blessing to some of the leaders you're aware of, and I think God can encourage uh, some of the pioneers that are stepping into this and, and plant some seeds in those that maybe haven't thought like this before in terms of from a regional perspective. But I believe God's helping us and directing our, our thoughts in this way because he has a heart not just for the nations at large, but for regions within each nation in which we're planted. So yeah, we're planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. And so we're going to see that take place in our generation. Amen. Well, let me, let me do this. I want to give a plug for you because you don't do this, you know, but I want to say something about kingdom culture exchange that has really impressed me. Um, most of the networking and I would say the companies and apostolic companies that are moving around in the earth are very vertical in their nature or their platforms where they're horizontal and yet they don't have much synergy other than communication and camaraderie. And yet what you are attempting to do is I would say very cutting edge because you're, you're reaching out to people like me who, I mean, we have a network. We have several networks that, that we not only have birthed, but we're, we're working with and helping to nurture. And yet you engage me on a friendship level, on a peer level, and on an apostolic grace level. And so it's real easy for me to converge with you because you've created the on-ramp for me to do that. Hmm. And it's not just for friendship. We're in this thing for forever. We're in this thing to see the kingdom expand. And so because you're creating the on-ramps without the monetary mindset, without tying that to mammon, I think you're modeling something that we're all going to gain much from. So I, I, I just want to toot your horn, uh, and I want others to really understand the selflessness that that takes, because we all know that if we spend all our energy doing things that don't bring some monetary reward, we can wear ourselves out and not have the wherewithal to do what we're called to. And yet, that's exactly what you're doing, because you're putting your faith in something much bigger than money. And okay. so I applaud you, my friend. And and we're in this thing together. I'm excited. Amen. I appreciate you, my brother. In case those of you that don't know what that is, Kingdom Culture Exchange is the name of a ministry network um, that involves uh, different types of relationships. Uh, those that uh, might be father-son relationship, those that might be big brother, little brother relationships, those that are more peer relationship, mutual accountability relationships, but just a spiritual family that lets the Holy Spirit uh, connect and converge on a, an assignment level. It's, it's a spiritual family that spans over the states and the and the in the world, the number of nations that we're in now. So, amen. So I believe that that's a like you said, we model the, these principles on smaller scale before we're qualified or can really step into a more of a regional expression. And so that's that's what I've seen in my personal relationships and in Kingdom Culture Exchange Network. We've stepped into something 
that's producing fruit, you know, that, that qualifies us to contend. And that's what we've been doing with these conferences is exemplifying and creating a culture and atmosphere of oneness on another level. And so we're beginning to contend for regions now. And I believe uh, God smiles upon that. So because it's not about one person getting the glory. It's not about mammon. It's not about power. It's not about control. It's about God. What is your heart and how can we work together to see your vision come to pass? Uh, it was at um, Haggai chapter one, you know, every man was running at, to their own panel house, but God's house lies in ruins. Mm -hmm. I think it's when we all make God's house a priority that God's going to make sure all of our houses are taken care of. It's not about trying to hoard to ourselves or uh, gain uh, notoriety or attention. It's about God, what is on your heart? And how can we work together to see your kingdom come? Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and close with that there. God bless you. Appreciate all of you uh, watching. Share this with uh, uh, your peoples. And next week we will be back. Next week I've got a friend of mine from Australia going to be joining us, David Balestri. You're going to love him. Uh, he's also pioneered some uh, uh, some things all along these lines in his nation and is going to be sharing with you a number of things that are going to stir some uh, some really good things in you. He's been a blessing to me and I believe also David as well and a number of leaders within our network. So he, we've really converged on a, a level of friendship and ministry uh, encouragement as well. And so uh, just thankful to be a part of his life. Uh, so I'm gonna be just going to share a little bit of with him with you. If you're not familiar with him, you're going to want to uh, get a hold of some of what he's got to offer. He's a phenomenal entrepreneur and speaks to a lot of uh, Christian businessmen and pastors about how to really engage in the marketplace and see the kingdom expression uh, expand in that dimension. So that's going to really stir you that, that way as well. But next week, same time, same channel. Uh, we'll see you next week here. Yes, have a great week. And uh, uh, we will see you then. All right, signing off. Bless you.